sovereign Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. If there's any that are poor here, financially or in spirit, we announce good news to you here this afternoon. To proclaim freedom for the captives. If there's anyone that feels captive to circumstance or addiction, we proclaim freedom over you this afternoon. We speak against shame and we proclaim your freedom, your loved, your gods. He is gonna come with the key and unlock the door. The release from darkness for the prisoners, it says to proclaim it's the time of God's favour. If you're mourning, receive comfort this afternoon. If you're grieving, the provider is here this afternoon. If all you've got left is ashes, we're going to crown you with beauty this afternoon. If you're mourning, here's the oil of gladness. If you're fatigued, if your spirit is languid and heavy and despairing, we're going to dress you in a garment of praise this afternoon. You were made to be oaks of righteousness, that's what it says. A planting of the Lord to show his splendor. Turn the morning into dancing, Lord. Turn the morning into dancing, Lord. Lift off the heaviness, the fatigue, the despair. Replace it with joy, Lord. Those of us with ashes, Crown us with your beauty, Lord. It's time, it's time, it's time, it's time. We've been traveling through the valley, but it's time. The open plains are in front of you. The new day of God's purpose is in front of you. You've stretched, you've served, you've kept going. And the new day, the new era is here. Oh, and here's his promise. My spirit will help you. My spirit will heal you my spirit will guide you so just put your hand in mine just put your hand in mine my spirit will guide you oh and my spirit will help you so put your hand in mine come on put your hand in mine oh yeah. you don't need no five-year plan you don't need to know everything you just need to know one thing that's that I am with you. Put your hand in mine. Put your hand in mine. It's a new day. It's a new day. It's a new day. Put your hand in mine. Oh, and put your heart in mine. You can trust me. Oh, put your hand in mine mm -hmm. Put your heart in mine No more
more revolving doors No more going round the mountain It's time to strike out to a brand new day New things are falling from heaven New ways are falling from heaven So put your hand in mine yeah. Father we speak especially to those Weighed down by fatigue from the recent seasons I think in different ways most of us have been there so don't feel alone, don't feel shame. Just know this, he's giving you a garment of praise instead of a spirit of fatigue. To those who just feel, oh, I'm just weary, I can't be bothered. God's giving you your bother back. <laughs> giving you your joy back giving you your, I'll go again. I'll go one more time. People watching online right now, the Spirit of God falling on you in your homes right now. Falling on those sat in offices right now. Filling those listening to this on repeat. If the Holy Spirit can fill you when you read the book of Ephesians, written 2,000 years ago, He can fill you and touch your life when you listen to this. One, two, three, four years from now, Spirit of God, flood homes, flood lives. Set us up for this new era, God. Set us up for this new era. It's you we adore. Singing hallelujah. Hallelujah. We'll serve you in the good and we'll serve you in the bad. Sing it high. good give someone a hug and take a seat if you're watching online high fry the screen and then clean it that's the best you can do wonderful wow God's good amen he is good he is good he is good hmm um, I haven't got any with me, but uh, and in fact, I've only got this proof copy, but my last book is called The Divine Reset. And it really, so in 2017, I, I began to talk about a new era that I felt was coming and some of what that was, that was about. Then 2020 hit and this really kind of pulls together all the stuff that I connected up with a load of my prophetic friends across the UK, America, South Africa, Australia mainly. And it was amazing the alignment between prophetic voices around the world going, this is where I think God is leading us. And so this is my journey and I'm kind of touching on some of the stuff from this book today. And then it's, this is kind of end of 2020, I wrote this, so it's kind of progressed on since then. But if you wanna go deeper, and in fact, this is, there's, there's, it's, it's, it's a book, um, but it's also a journal because there's a lot of questions it's going to ask you about your life, hoping to nudge you into the best posture for your future, which is very unique to each of us. But also it's a team development book too. So your team can go through, I think there's 10 sessions to go through to line up your church, your team, your ministry um, for the new era. So if that interests you, uh, just have a little look, look online, Amazon or jarrodcooper.net and... Um, and uh, it'll just go deeper and further than the stuff I'm sharing today if you're finding it's resonating with you. So, uh, uh, turbulent seas. So I, I grew up in, in Gibraltar, as I, I shared with you, and my, my first job out of school was I worked on boats. So on uh, nice sailing boats like um, uh, 
Simon Le Bon's boat drum, you know, the one that lost its keel, wasn't my fault, but, um, and some of the uh, uh, boats out, the Bond movies, and um, so it was a tough life living as a missionary, it was really tough. And, uh, and then some years later, I'll do this briefly, you may have heard this story, but I wanna, I wanna kinda use it to line us up. Some years later, I was invited to go sailing around the Greek islands as a freebie. Now, you really hate me now, don't you, Gibraltar? I'm a freebie. No, it was, was really nice. You would have said yes, too. So I ended up on this. And, uh, uh, and, and there was just this, this one time when uh, uh, the place where we wanted to stay the night with the boat was all full. So, so we, we had to head off across the open sea into the night in a storm. And um, so there's about six church ministers on this boat and a little crew. And um, I mean, you know, an hour in, uh, people were looking a bit green and a bit, you know, seasick. Seasickness is a horrible feeling, isn't it? And so one by one, the guys are like, oh, I'm going down to my bed and, you know, heading down into the hold. And myself and a friend, because I would worked on boats and we were like, no, 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 you don't want to go down there. You want to be where you can see the horizon, right? because it just helps you with the, with, the, with the motion and all that kind of thing. And, and we had about another three hours to do. And this, this, this boat had three masts that stick in the air and then one that sticks out the front. Can you picture that? Three point, then one out the front's called a bowsprit, right? And it usually, often has a net underneath it. And so I'm looking around the boat. No, 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 you don't want to be down there. Where should we go, Simon? Don't want to be up in the crow's nest. No, that's really bad. Then I saw the bowsprit. I said, Simon, let's tie ourselves to the bowsprit. So we tied ourselves to the bowsprit and headed out on this boat and it got rougher and rougher. You know, the first time my bum actually hit the water, it was like, oh, mummy, I think I've made a mistake, you know, and going up and down. We hollered, we screamed, we told stories, we laughed. And three hours later, we got off the bowsprit and kind of stumbled onto deck and looked at each other like we'd been through some great life-changing experience and said, that was the best day of my life. <laughs> Then out from the hole underneath where the beds are came these, you know, four or five other pastors wiping the sick off their chins and, you know, looking at us and like, that was the worst day of my life. <laughs> Same journey. Postures everything. Positions everything. Attitudes everything. Uh, maybe seeing the horizon is everything. So I want to do for this second session, I hope to just lift us onto the bowsprit because it's going to feel rough the next few years if we're stuck in the hole just going, I wish it was 1984 when we could sing, come on and celebrate again and again. <laughs> it's come on and vegetate now. Do you know what I mean? I'm just, <laughs> right. Uh, we're going forward. Anybody else want to go forward? Right. Yeah. But you can't go forward hiding in the past hoping that the world doesn't do you harm, hoping that the church puts itself back together post-COVID as it always was. No, the past is in the past. I believe God is doing something brand new. And so what I hope to do is lift us to the bowsprit, spirit, lift us to a place where we can see the horizon and get a little bit of sense. Okay, so I think roughly we're heading in that sort of direction. That's what God's trying to do. Let's cooperate. And here's the thing. So I, I want us to head into the future excited, realizing that God is good. He's got you. You don't need to be some awesome theologian or an awesome prophet to work out roughly where God's taking us. Let's get excited. Really, all you need to do is put your hand in his like you always have done and trust him. He will speak to you about the future. And here's one of my prayers. And God, when I'm being thick, shout. <laughs> Amen. Amen. He has the ability to clip us around the ear and, no, over here, dipstick, right? And moves us into the future. So I have no doubt that God is able to work with our weakness. Amen? So let me just share with you. Uh, in, in the mid-90s, I began to have a series of encounters. And um, out of it, I wrote a song called Days of Wonder. Around about the same time I wrote King King's Majesty. I wrote a song called Days of Wonder. Uh, I was having an awesome experience of, of God's glory in South Africa. But while I was there, I was having visions of the United Kingdom hit by a move of the glory of God. I saw Parliament rocking with the sense of the glory of God. The royal family touched, media invaded, city centres where people were popping out of wheelchairs and blind eyes were opening and people were coming to Christ. Uh, a, 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 a 
hospital wards that were emptied by the saints going in and beginning to pray and stuff like this. Now, some of these things have happened in the past, but I believe we're heading to an era of glory. And the term I gave them in the mid 90s was days of wonder. And if you've got a good memory, we started a radio program probably 20 years ago and we called it days of wonder and it had the days of wonder song on it. But you've got to understand, I'm, I'm like a stick of rock. I've got one thing inside of me. We're heading towards a movement of glory in the earth. How do I know that? Well, he's told us what the end game is. The glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's going to be thick. It's going to be deep. It's going to be everywhere. God's going to move. So we have to maneuver ourselves into what God wants to do. So as a heading, I would say we're heading for days of wonder. But what I want to break it down to is into days of this and days of that and days of the other. Now, <clears throat> does anybody <clears throat> want me to miss out certain sections? Shall I not bother with days of persecution? Shall I leave that to one side? We'll save that for Sunday morning in church, right? Get your pastor to do it. Day, days of more shaking and trouble. Anybody want to do that? No, let's just put it to one side. Days of great upheaval in the earth. Anybody want to go there? No, I'm going to do the nice stuff because I feel like being a cheerful prophet this afternoon. Is that okay? So we'll miss out the days of war and the days of persecution. But you've got to understand life is often like train tracks. A lot of the best stuff happens when a lot of the darkest stuff is happening. Arise, shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. See thick darkness is over the people all right so when I share what I'm going to share don't sit thinking well that's it it's going to be utopian and easy actually in the midst of great darkness I believe we are heading towards days of wonder days of God moving in the earth, of parliament being touched. And in, in, in actual fact, since the 1990s, it's amazing what God has already done of some of the things that I've seen. And I'll go into that a little bit later on. But listen, get your hearts ready for a remarkable move of God. Don't you dare get boring on us. Don't live to pay off the mortgage. Live for an adventure, right? Because as far as God's concerned, do you realize he looks at this room and he says, I think they're all in full-time ministry. The retired ones, the teachers, those working in restaurants, those working on reception, those working in accountancy. He, he, he doesn't look at the pastors and go, okay, they're the full timers. I can use them a bit more. I think he looks at every single one and goes, come on, let's have an adventure. Right? There's an adventure to be had. So days of God moving. Right? So let, I'm going to do different days of. Are you ready? I think we're heading into days of innovation where God is downloading new methods and new ways into the church right now. And that is, <laughs> whisper to your neighbor, easier said than done. Come on, work with me, right? Because we all know what church can be like. We can be the frozen chosen, right? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Spirit of rigor mortis, and we're just stuck in the past. Baptized in lemon juice, looking miserable about every change. Oh, I don't like the flowers that side. I like them that side. Oh, God help us, right? <laughs> But we're going into days of innovation, new things, new ways. Uh, it's been well prophesied way before I, I ever came along that this great move of revival that's coming to the earth is going to be known almost as a leaderless one. Do you know, can I, can I say, oh, let me just, now I'm, 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 I'm prophesying here so my wording isn't exact, okay? I'm, a, I'm allowed to use hyperbole just like Jesus. So just work with me because it'll just stir the room up. I like it. Right. The days of the alpha male leader are over, even in the church, right? There is a move of the body of Christ arising where, where there'll still be heroes and leaders around and all that kind of stuff of all sorts of hues. But here's the main thing. We don't just need, you know, 50 good preachers in the world, do we? We need a body of Christ that rises up. The things we've been learning about discipleship and body ministry and intercession and deliverance and healing and healthy thinking and mental health and all, the, all these things the church has been learning the last few decades. Listen, it is so that we become more like a murmuration in the earth. Do you know what one of them is? You know, when the starlings in the sky, just somehow there's something invisible guiding this incredible move of God. I don't know about you, that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for a new denomination. I'm not looking for some new spiritual empire or the latest, greatest megachurch. I'm looking for a move of God. 
You're going to find that in, in, in the coming days, actually you'll find that really it's the small church that starts to win. There's something beautiful about the family feel in the small church. It's the day of the small church. Now we've been learning something through the mega church movement that was really necessary to, to learn. But also understand that smaller churches need, and this has been happening, need to not feel second class, but rather use the size that you are. Listen, some churches are giant regiments, others are SAS teams. Start to enjoy who you are. God can do more with two than 200 sometimes, more with 12 than with 300, right? More with 300 than 30,000. Get your head around the fact that just fall in love with what God wants you to do. Stop copy and pasting. These are days of innovation. Um, uh, just before lockdown, six months before the first lockdown, so 2019, I was in Australia and I, I had a dream and it didn't really excite me if I'm honest. Catch this, sometimes God will speak to you and it won't excite you, but he'll download something in you that's a bit like Noah seeing the ark before it ever rained. We've got to be open to it. So six months before the first lockdown, I had this dream of me teaching people and it, people encountering God in their homes. And a, a, a leader figure in my life, bit of a hero, popped up in the dream. God will often come dressed in somebody that you admire and respect. And this leader said, it's about the twos and threes in their homes, not about the crowds. Now, I woke up and went, oh, I quite like a good crowd, me. Do you know what I mean? I like a good meeting. But I was so impacted by the dream. There's something there that it's through media, it's through, through the internet, whatever. So we, we got home from this trip and just converted one of our garages into, into a, a little studio to broadcast from and started this online learning community. Well, of course, you know, two months later, COVID lockdown, suddenly we're ahead of the pack. We've got it already made. We go from just training a couple of dozen in a classroom into training hundreds around the world online that goes on today. There are innovations that God wants to download into us. And we go, God, well, that didn't excite me at first. But God's in heaven going, yeah, but I know what's about to happen. Listen for my downloads. I grew up in, in <coughs> uh, 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 how shall I put this? Even from a 19-year-old, all my heroes were, were, we'd call them today, mega church pastors. I mean, I just love how they can communicate, keep people, you know, enraptured for an hour. And, and of course, you think, well, lots of people getting saved, all good stuff and all that kind of thing. And so, you know, as the years have rolled on for me, you, we do what we all do, which is, okay, well, the, the church is quite an inconvenience, really, but the church keeps growing, right? And your church grows, and well, okay, we need a bigger building. And a, I, uh, we landed just a few years before before uh, lockdown um, uh, in this world of, okay, we're, we're, we're aiming for a thousand seat warehouse building and I guess what you do to house people seems like the right thing. And then I, I slowly, my little eyes look at the size of the mortgage payments and the, it was getting more and more difficult to plan a building. And then, then, then COVID hit and I'll be honest with you, with our model of church, it was big, but I was not happy. I knew the amount of transfer growth it's possible as a church to swell but not grow. Yeah. Do you know, if everybody's just shifting from another church to your church, the church hasn't grown. We haven't fulfilled our purpose. And I knew we're the biggest we've ever been, but I'm so unhappy because the, I know how many people have actually got saved and stayed. I don't mean hands in the air, that we try and make it sound like it's significant. I mean disciples of Jesus Christ that have newly come to faith. And I knew our staff bill was the biggest it had ever been, but we'd seen the least people saved in 2019 that I'd ever seen. And so I was frustrated and I had a choice. Oh, are they, we can carry on looking good or we can say, God, there has to be something new, right? So when the first lockdown happened and you were all miserable, I went, oh, thank God. <laughs> it stopped, right? And in the pause, I was saying, God, this, we had a two and a half million pound building project that became four and a half million. I'm looking at it, I'm looking at the finances. I'm, it's the middle of lockdown, nobody's going to church anywhere. I think, oh God, we're, we're so, the, God, please. In the end, my prayer was this, as I worked through all the struggles of the model, the big church, the, the big mortgage payment, the, I called it the big gray box, you know, a big warehouse type. Of, I said, God, please. This is my honest prayer in the middle of lockdown. Please don't make me lead a church in a big gray box with a big mortgage, please. God, there's gotta be more than that model. Now we've learned some good, models are neither holy nor unholy. Yeah. They're either just useful or, 
or causing harm, right? Man, God, there's got to be something going on. Then there was something else going on in our world with our church. We're a hundred year old church next year. So we've got a good age spread. And, and I, I'm usually in a church, you'll find that, not always, but with longevity pastors in, 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 in particular, and I've been around at our church 20 years, the congregation are largely 10 to 20 years either side of the, of the lead couple or whatever. Do you know what I mean? That, you know, it kind of roughly happens. And, I, and I'm watching the younger end of our church, and I know statistically that's getting smaller than it should be. And every time I mention it to our church, they go, oh, but we're not old. <laughs> you know revival's taking place when you catch the last verse in the Old Testament, the hearts of the fathers turn to the children. So anyway, I'm in the middle of praying, God, do something different. You can't just say new and then not do new. You can't say, it's a new era, we're doing new things. And then we come along and it's still three fast songs, three slow songs, and a sermon, then a happy song because we're going home to watch the Grand Prix. And, and you know, we're in these buildings with steeples and, and, you know, God, what is the new? I want to be on the cutting edge. I want to be on the bowsprit. I don't want to catch up with you 20 years late. I haven't, you know, time's ticking. <laughs> Hair is receding backwards, <laughs> right? Anyway, so I'm wrestling through and I start to look at land and I start to look at farms and, and, and then I find out about five of my prophetic friends are all buying or been given farms at the moment. There's something about people searching for seven day church, not just Sunday centric church. Churches where the lights never go out and the, there's always food on the table and always pastoral care. And I've discovered this, I'm a glory boy. I'm, I'm used to moves of God. If there isn't a move of God in the church, I'm like, well, it's just shallow end, isn't it? I don't want ankle deep church. I want waist deep or you can barely swim in it church, right? Now I know you can never build that off a Sunday centric church where people only come three times, you know, every two months. Let's be honest, it's all just too thin and too shallow. So God, there's got to be more. What is it? So it's, so somewhere to just be and see you move and houses of prayer and 24-7 worship and, and, and food and, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, anyway, in June this year, I, we got our innovation answer. I walked in and I met this business owner and landowner, and I didn't know I was meeting a just come back to the Lord Christian, who burst into tears, had been expecting someone to walk through the door, and then she's like, it's you, isn't it? It's you. Uh, and three weeks ago, we got the keys to a uh, three to four acre adventure park. <laughs> and it's got a dome that will seat about 700, and high ropes and low ropes and roller skates and go-karts and zip lines and archery and log cabin cafe and, and just acres of fun and, 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 and got it debt free. And, and we're there with this incredible, people are like, are you gonna turn the adventure park into, into a, you know, a place of worship? I'm like, no, we're gonna run an adventure park. <laughs> it's, it, it, these are the days for churches to start to be a bit more like businesses and start to be a bit more like we're, we're right up to our elbows in the community. When, when, when school's out, there's like over a thousand kids in this place every day. And listen, while they're heading down those zip lines, I expect them to bump into Jesus at the bottom. That's the idea. We're already seeing. Listen, there are places right now, I don't know if you'll understand this, but there are places where the heavens are thin. And in this particular zone, right next to a farm that I'm still trying to get my hands on, and, 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 and this adventure park, there's just something there. People are walking onto the land and shaking under the power of the Holy Spirit. They want to take their shoes off. There's something where the heavens are thin and right now God is opening up things like land and innovations and new places to be and it will probably be nothing like I've just described my journey but here's the thing this is where we need to innovate so what's your journey I had to actively give up my desire for a thousand seat box and a big mortgage to say God what do you if, if God if you could really it's ridiculous to say it like this isn't it if you could or would do anything you wanted I can't even imagine it, God, and it frustrates me because I consider myself to be quite insightful. But there I am, thick as two short planks, not having a clue what he wants to do. Then he goes, there you go, Adventure Park. Fill it with teenagers and let's have a move of God among the young. Because I was seeing the whole appear in the young. Like, God, how do we get them to church? I, I've got to be honest, the music will never be good enough. I say that as a musician. It's ne we're never going to compete. 
It's got to be something else that God is doing. And listen, it's time for us to get away from our gray boxes and our old fashioned looking buildings and, and our culture. I mean, look at most of our Sunday services are modeled half on a corporate conference and half on a pop concert. They are. It's just culture. We do the same, light stage. Is there some way? Oh, God, do you know what I hate? Rows, rows of seats. Oh, can't there be some way where there's tables and food and half the people are lounging and there's, there's ketchup flying down your face while you receive the Holy Spirit? Could there be a culture that feels like home? Because, listen, the days we're going into are not only days of wonder and days of innovation. They've got to be days of family like never before. Because, listen, we've got lonely churches out there. And almost the difficult thing is the more successful we are as a church, the lonelier church feels. As soon as you go over about 50 people, it's an event. And people can no longer necessarily know every name and hear every story and be known. But shouldn't church be a place where we're known? So, you got, so, so listen, I'm almost speaking against my own culture. I'm used to platforms. I've grown up in and around music and lights and platforms. But there's a bit of me going, but, but couldn't, can't someone innovate a living room where it's, it's circles, not rows? It's being known. It's family. Do, do we really have to sit through three fast songs, three slow songs till Jesus comes home again? Or could be some other way of God moving powerfully with a bit of imagination? When we get beyond the song list and the set list and we get back to, I wonder what Jesus would do. Do you think if Jesus turned up to church, he'd really stand up the front and say, right, we're going to three, three little fast songs and three little so songs. And now I just get a feeling that the presence of God would be there. Miracles would be popping. It, we, there'd be conversations and fun and let's be honest arguments and all kinds of other stuff going on and lots of play how do we get family back into church life how do we here's the here's here's the big thing for me guys and everybody hates it when I say it we're about to lose a generation The very generation that prayed for revival might just be too stuck to turn their hearts and say, let's do something for them. So that whatever we do as we leave this, this world in the next decades, we know there are teenagers, there are 20 somethings, there are kids that know the power and the glory of God. I mean, a lot of us grew up in the after effects of the Jesus revolution, but listen, we have a responsibility now to hand it on. And that might require changing our music and our shape and when we meet and how we meet and all this kind of thing, but we have to grab the teenage, the 20, the child generation. There has to be something. Then we pull them into our tent. Like, the story of Moses, you know, putting his tent of meeting outside the, 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 the noisy Israelites as they traveled through the wilderness. There would have been hundreds of funerals going on all the time as God killed off a generation. It would have been noisy in that wilderness, right, with a million Jews in funerals day after day, which is what was going on. No wonder Moses said, I think I'm going to pitch my tent on the outside of the camp. It's a bit quieter. But here's what the story tells us. Is it Exodus 32, 33, something like that? It says, you know, Moses pitched a tent and he met God face to face. You know the story, right? And it said, uh, but his young aide Joshua never left the tent. It's time to bring young people into something meaningful of an encounter with God. It starts with them watching us. Meet God and follow God, watching us innovate, watching us perform a miracle, watching us stirring God. We've got to leave an imprint for the young. So listen, these are days, here's another one, days of fatherhood and days of motherhood. When an older generation that longed for so much more to happen, instead go, but now I live for the next generation. We're going to father and mother them into a move of God. I think that's what God's saying. And there's a reignition coming to what I call the silver surfers. It's good, right, no, you have resp no, no, don't you go disappearing yet. You've got to bring them into your tent of everything you know. You know more about discipleship, you know more about the prophetic and healing and deliverance and intercession and worship and stuff like that, then you know it is time to bring the next generation in. Bring them into your tent and let them watch you and understand the mechanics of how it works because we need to hand a move of God on to the next generation.
A friend of mine who I'm sure some of you will know, John Conrath. Yeah. Yeah, John Conrath, good friend of mine. And um, um, he took his son out to a, a mission somewhere in Africa. I can't remember where, where it was. And, and um, <clears throat> I think he was about 14 at the time, his son. And he, he said to his dad, Dad, great to be with you, but please don't make me do anything. You know, I know what you can be like. I'm just along for the ride. Good company. Let's just enjoy it. Anyway, he got to this one night in this crusade and John had a word of knowledge about it. I think it was something like there is, there is 13 people, it was a specific thing like that, who are blind here tonight. Come forward, God's going to heal you. Well, the right number of people came and lined up, all blind at the front. And then he must have forgotten in all the, you know, the, 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 the craziness of a service like that, that his son had said, don't call me forward, don't get me involved, I'm just here to watch, sort of thing. He said, oh, coming out here. Then he said, God says you're to pray for these blind people. And his, his son's like, are you kidding me, Dad? He says, yeah, well, well, what do I do? He says, well, I don't know, just stick your hands out and kind of load up a little bit and listen to God and then say whatever God tells you to say and pray for him. So he's... Okay, I don't know what load up means, but anyway, he's just, and he's there and he prays and then he starts to pray. Every single one down the line, the blind eyes are opening. He gets in the car at the end of the service and, 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 and heads back before his dad. So he went back with some of the team. By the time John got back to his hotel room, he opens the door, sharing a room with his son. He walks in, there's his son, sat on the edge of his bed with his Bible open, shaking, going, it's real, isn't it, dad? This God thing. Is, I've got to start reading my Bible. This stuff's real, isn't it? He brought him into his tent. We cannot just live, we cannot just leave the empty husks of an old move of God behind. It is time to usher the young into a move of God. And while some of us the posture can be almost defensiveness about our older generation. But we've still got stuff we want to do. Yeah, this is the thing to do. This is the thing we want to do. We want, you will, you, your heart will throb and swell with joy when you see those kids and those teenagers coming through for Christ. There's something about days of fatherhood and motherhood falling on the church right now. And we need to bring them into our tents. Amen. Oh boy, oh. So listen, let's have a few more farms and adventure parks, right? There's gonna be churches that look like businesses, businesses that look like churches. Get ready, like I say, for the small church, even the house church, there's a movement coming. And I know right now we don't even know how to organize all that. Maybe it doesn't need organizing. Maybe it just needs pastoring and caring, but there is a move of God that is gonna flood this world. It's the kind of move that exactly UCB has been raised up for. Such a move that you can't quite control it in your classic denominations. There is a move of God God going to hit the UK and Europe and the world. We need to be ready for it. That's what's on the Atlantic horizon of God's purposes. That's why you've been going through hell to get your heart and your skills ready to go. Okay, what really matters is that we get out and we see days of wonder and days of innovation and days of family and days of fatherhood, days of something fresh bubbling up in the church. Amen. Get ready for ha oh, oh, churches in restaurants. Hallelujah. That's my kind of church. Churches in coffee shops, churches, just gatherings. Oh, on a Sunday morning. No, it might be a Thursday night. You can have totally devoted in love with, passionate about, totally surrendered to, uh, to Jesus, people that never go to church on a Sunday. Yeah. And with our society changing, this is a problem we need to solve. If your church can only grow to the amount of people that can make it on a Sunday morning, well, we got big problems. It's time to have, so I don't know how, I'm just stirring it up, churches where the doors never close and the lights never go out. But there's always a miracle to be had and a meal to be had. There's always a story to be heard and a name to be known. Because there is a lonely world that needs to feel the presence of God, like some of you are feeling the presence of God right now. There's a lonely world that needs not a religious church with the leftovers of some Pentecostal revival, but instead a place that is alive with the murmurations of heaven right now on the face of the earth. Get ready for it. Right, it's about to get wild, hallelujah. We're going into days of wild prayer and worship. Yeah. I, 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 got this, I got this sense under lockdown that God was saying the show is over. 
it, churches, listen, all kinds of churches will always go on. You've only got to look at the landscape to know that, that churches go for hundreds of years after God lifted off a model, okay? That's the power of religion. It's what happens. But if you want to be on the cutting edge, I think we're going to find, and I'm not even sure how, but I, I'm, I, I just got this thing in me that we're, that we're going to discover how to do church that isn't just locked into what the platform does, but, but rather there's, a, there's, this, there's this burning up in the congregation. I mean, I remember being in a, in a move of God in the early 90s, and, and we actually for three months we stopped music from the front altogether. And we learn how to worship as a church. You want to read the story? Read my book, Glory in the Church. It's my first book. It was all about how actually as a worship leader, I can be the very thing that locks the culture and stops God's glory from moving. And so we went on an experiment. It's only a little church, maybe 100 people, something like that. And so we learned how to, well, how did the early church meet God? Without a projector. <laughs> Not a single microphone in sight. Right? And yet they had the glory of God and the dead raised and the ground shaking when they prayed. Sometimes it's not that we can't head in the direction of revival. It's just that we're so full of other stuff. We're so burdened down. But listen, God is always going to be through a narrow door where you've got to give up baggage to enter into the new. There'll always be something. And it's easy to give up the evil and the wicked and the bad and the stuff that doesn't work. It's harder to give up the stuff that half works and that still feeds us a little bit and that once felt really good and that makes us feel comfortable and that it all blesses us with the anointing of nostalgia. It's hard to give up that stuff. But that's what we're going to have to give up if we're heading forward. Now, here's, here's one thing, because I sound like a revolutionist. Yeah. And well, I am a little bit, but can I just say, so just let, let me just add some tenderness in here. Evolve, don't destroy. Because the church is full of early adopters, late adopters, people that find change easy people that find it hard. I always used to think that, well, I like change, I used to tell, but I don't, you know. You know what I discovered? I really don't like it when change is done to me. I like it when I'm the instigator of change with God. Oh, hallelujah, come on, people, let's go for it. Then when somebody does change to me, it's, ooh, hang on, slow down. So let's, in the midst of all of this stuff, there is a pastoral move. There's a make sure you're not just in love with the concepts of the future, but the people of the future, the ones sat next to you. The churches that we want to see them reformed and, and burning again with a light to the gospel. Everybody knows that takes time, right? So in the context of all of this, put on love. Let it be days of family. Where was I? Days of wild prayer and worship. Listen, the spontaneous is coming back. I, I just find that as you scratch the surface of the set list Christianity that works through its songs that they practiced on the Thursday night, but you scratch the surface in most congregations and you just go, what, we're actually free to pray? There's an explosion waiting to happen in so many churches. If we just... Oh, can I say it? Just listen, uh, 2 Chronicles 5. When the glory of God came, it said, the priest stepped back. Go for it. Did I say something? Good. School run. Oh, bless you. Anoint you. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Are you on the school? Go, go for it. School run. Absolutely. I won't make it for my son now. So, too far. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. There has to be an element of us stepping back from control to find God in the midst of us, yeah. right? In other words, we've just got a bit too good at it all. Yeah. If we get back to a little bit of childlike, I wonder what God might do today. I wonder if we leave it open enough. We've, we've got a rough plan, we've got a sketch plan, but really we're, 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 we're hunting for the breath of God. And let's be honest, it just might not come through one of the important people on the platform. It just might come through a seven-year-old somewhere in the crowd who five minutes ago was picking his nose, but now has got a word from God. You see, that is real church. That's the kind of church Jesus was looking for, right? I mean, we had, here's another one, days of revival and glory are coming. I, I remember about 12 years ago, going through a wave of revival in our church for about three years, literally people popping out of wheelchairs, dozens and dozens and dozens of deaf ears opening and it was nearly all through 14 and 15 year olds yeah. who genuinely <laughs> picking their nose one minute then laying hands on you the next yeah. 
and God was moving. Sweeping through the church, nine hour services when you just couldn't stop, you didn't know what was gonna happen next, you were lying on your face. Uh, the BBC turning up to film because they'd heard of the miracles, BBC Two this was on. Um, people came to the church, to the healing meetings. I remember being in one, little healing, like 80 people there, not a big meeting, Sunday night, and there's a commotion at the back, and in walks this little group with somebody, obviously with some kind of a problem with their hand, and, and they walked straight up to me up the front in the middle of this kind of prayer time, and I'd never seen them before. I said, I, uh, ooh, why, why are you here? And this person had a mangled up hand. They said, we thought we'd come here instead of A&E because you'd see us quicker. <laughs> and we prayed and I watched as the hand was healed in my hands. Come on, come on. Days of glory and revival, waves of it through the church. Now you can't always live on mountain tops. You live in valleys generally. But listen, we need to keep visiting the mountain tops of those intense times when all we can do is pray, and for three months all we've got is nightly meetings. You can't live like that. You go bonkers living like that. But you've got to visit the mountains of glory and the mountains of the moves of God, where your faith is expanded and your sight is increased, and you see the horizon once again, and then you head down into the valley with the purposes of God. Let's have days of revival once again, right? I'm beginning to smell it right now. A, mo a month ago, we saw the dead raised. Um, uh, uh, one of the people co connected to our church family, uh, a wonderful lady, her, she, uh, her, her daughter was having a son and, and the little baby was born in the first day had three cardiac arrests and, and, and then died. And um, and so they called this, this lady and, and said, um, it's unsaved son-in-law, to get the story right, and said, he's, he's, he's gone, he's died. She said, take me through to the room, put the phone on speakerphone and hold it over him right now and I'll pray. She began to pray, in Jesus' name, life, in Jesus' name, life. And then he go, no, no nothing. Uh, so, okay, you put your hand on his chest and you say, in Jesus' name, live. So this unsaved son-in-law put his hand on the little baby's chest, in Jesus' name, live. And she began to hear the crying down the phone as he came back to life. Come on. If unsaved people are raising the dead, church, visit the mountaintops. There is a grace available for this new era. Don't get taken up in sulking over the turbulence. There is a grace available for the era that we're going into where miracles, signs and wonders available even to our children is bubbling through. God, do a work among us. Days of revival, days of glory, days of collaboration. Oh boy, I'm looking forward to churches where you don't quite know who the leader is. They share staff, churches share buildings. Uh, you know what I mean? We get away from the empire building and suddenly we got this move of God happening in the earth. Come on, like never before. God do it. What time am I on? Okay, we finish at five o'clock, right? I just keep going. Good. Now, can, can I, can, let, let me, I've got two more to do. Let, let me, you're getting something this afternoon. I'm just stirring it up. I hope you're getting something. Oh, hallelujah. I don't fully understand this one, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Is that all right? Then you can go and work out if it's nonsense or not. Prophets are allowed to do that, teachers aren't. That's the advantage, you just go and test this. But, so here's, here's been some of my experience. So I was talking about farms and land and adventure parks and all this kind of stuff. 18 months ago, <clears throat> I walked onto this one piece of land and it was like I'd walked through Narnia's wardrobe door. Oh, what is this? That it was, it was, it, you know, there were no ice witches or anything like that. There, no, it's just, it was just, oh my word, it's like a different world. There, there are places, and, and I'm getting this from a lot of prophetic friends around the world, separately, and then all, and you go, wow, you too. There, there is places where it's like the heavens are thin, and God is wanting the church to occupy certain spaces. Now, now, you know, let's do as much theology as we know. Let's not pretend to more to know more than we do, otherwise we come off cranky. But it's, let's stay biblical. We know that there's invisible realms all around us, right? And there's thrones and principalities and powers and places of rulership, is that right? I believe metaphorically, even in your home, there's a throne, right? 
Dad, Mum, you need to sit in that place of authority with authority over your home. There is authority realms that you must occupy. It's true of churches and ministries. We occupy spaces in the spirit, right? And, and we read about things like this in, in Daniel, now there's Prince of Regions even, and all this kind of stuff, and fights going on. I believe, uh, this is the best phrasing I can use, there are apostolic seats, there are bishops seats where God is wanting some church leaders to sit right now and to, and to bring the kingdom of God in. Places of intercession and care. This is not some kind of strange dominionism. This is care and love and intercession. But there are places, there's land going to be given to people, maybe even listening to this right now, maybe some of you in this room. God wants to give land and spaces that you must occupy because they're connected in some way to the spiritual realm. And if you track back through the Bible, you'll find stuff like Abraham praying in one place and then two generations on suddenly, poof, God is appearing in, the, in that place to a grandchild, right? There's something about the thinness of the heavens in certain places. And so he's saying, look, I want you to be in a certain place and I want you to pray and have a, or oh, what can we say? Put a place of glory, a house of prayer, a house of worship, a house of encounter. I don't know how you name it. Do something there that occupies that place in the spirit and be a place of miracles, signs and wonders for the world to be drawn to. Something going on right now. Listen, when I went onto that land and I felt what I felt and now and the adventure park is just around the corner from it, I drive off this bit of land and go, that would be a good start, Lord. And, and well, we're in there now. Um, when I first saw this land, all hell broke loose in my life. Uh, we ended up homeless for three months. I mean, as a family, we were homeless, physically attacked, a church split, friends turning against us. It was the most incredible, awful, uh, about 14 months of my life. And so in the middle of all this, there was one week just before last Christmas where I was dealing with eight solicitors in one week over three property problems. It was just my word. I have just never seen anything like it. I remember talking to a prophetic friend of mine. I said, what is going on? There's this. There's every, for physical attack, spiritual attack, church split, people turning against us. It's just gone nuts. And it was, is there land connected to what you're doing? Well, yeah, there's, the enemy does not want you to land and settle. He wants to keep you nomadic, doesn't mind you having your church services, but, but do not occupy as a church or an apostolic authority. I, I just speak this out right now. There are apostles who are landing and God is saying, I want you to be here and occupy that space and turn it into a little bit of heaven on earth. Right? And listen, you could see this all over the land. It's how God is going to fill the world with glory. But we've been, so many have been nomadic and in the wilderness for so many years. Right now we're in a season of landing and occupying. Days of apostolic occupation. Don't think empire. Think care, serve, steward, love, create a place where God is moving and the world is drawn to it. So I believe we're going into days of apostolic occupation and if you can grab something from what I kind of half feel like I know about that well hallelujah all I can say is thank God we've landed because that was the worst year of my life there's a fight over some of the stuff we're doing right now it's days of kingdom come don't worry about building church just bring the kingdom right I've got I had a friend who, who walked through um, a Walmarts in America and he got pictures of these missing kids. And he's from one of these kind of prophetic movements. They get numbers and times and dates and quite easily in their church services. He's like, God, you know where these kids are. C can you tell us? If you can tell us about the color of somebody's front door just to help confirm a prophecy a bit better, you know exactly where these kids are. He, got, he had one friend in the FBI that they contacted said, would it be of any use if we? And the FBI, was like, the FBI guy was like, yeah, but just don't give me doves and fires and all that. I need actionable information and we'll, we'll see. So he got six of his top prophetic people together and said, right, well, let's go away, pray for a couple of hours, come back together. If we get something repeated amongst us, we'll take that to the FBI. They came back, two or three of them got uncle, two or three of them got an address that was the same. They took that to the FBI. The FBI said, well, the uncle does live there and we have checked it once. We'll go back and check again. Within 48 hours, they'd found two children. 
This is where the church is going. The kingdom into the world. That same prophetic movement is helping the California Fire Service predict where fires might break out in the coming seasons because of all the problems a few years ago. It's time for us to invade the world. The t TV companies, behind the scenes, stop thinking that the best jobs are, I've got to have a job in the church. No, we need you on fire. Then we need you back out into the world, turning theater upside down and BBC upside down and, and politics upside down, right? We need to realize <clears throat> that very few of us should work within the four walls of a church. Most of us are actually called to be missionaries out into the world, but carrying the glory of God. These are days of kingdom. It's time to turn the world upside down. Amen. If you're a Christian who loves God, stop wishing that you were a pastor, a youth leader, or a worship leader. Let's get out into the world. All right, so I'll close with this one. And this one maybe, maybe, yeah, it's just a nice way to land. Days of intimacy. Should take some of the heaviness out of it. Um, where should we go with this one? All right. Uh, Saul, 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 David, and Goliath. Let's go, let's do that story, right? Saul. Saul's name means demanded. Everybody say demanded. demanded. David's name means beloved. Everybody say beloved. beloved. Goliath means to, to exile or to bar, to keep from, all right? Uh, so let's do the story. Goliath comes out shouting at the armies of Israel. Uh, 40 days in a row, probably shouts the same thing. They run in the same way. I mean, why they kept coming out after about day 20, I would have given up and gone, well, we know what's going to happen. We're going to go out there, rattle our weapons. He's going to shout. We're going to get scared and run away. Um, uh, and Saul is there, the demanded one, the demanded king, the king that was demanded for and demanded of. And, and along comes David, the beloved. Everybody say the beloved. The beloved. Oh, be the beloved. David comes along with his sling from the fields. He's the beloved of God. And he says, I'll, I'll take him, goes to Saul. I'll take this guy out. Saul dresses him in his armor. David says, I can't go in this. I haven't tested it. It's, it's, it's not mine. I'm not used to it. He takes the armor off. And then with just his sling, he heads out and you know, okay, I'm adding this bit, but he probably thought, that guy's head is so big, I cannot miss. <laughs> and he takes the guy out. He takes out the one who is exiling you from your future, right? Here it is. The beloved are gonna go places the demanded could never go. The demands of religion will not take us into our promised land. Even good modern Pentecostal charismatic religion what we need is to remain the beloved of God, right? Mark, would you just come and play a little bit for me and let's, let's land this plane together. My co-pilot, thanks mate. Um, <clears throat> David and his little sling and his love for God. All he, I, just, I come in the name of the Lord. Think of it for a minute, Saul, with all of his shiny armor, all of those weaponized army were useless. They had all the gear, but were full of fear. Then along comes one beloved boy. Who do you need to be for the future? Sophisticated, I've got all the stuff, I've got the shiny armor, I've done the training, I've done the courses. Listen, <laughs> doesn't matter how hard you try, it's the beloved that will break through into the future. I love God, he loves me, all I need is what he's given me. I don't need any other fancy tricks. I just need what he's called me to do in all of its uniqueness. And you create original churches and original ministries and an original fun and original impact just by the thing that God's called you to do. David comes along as the beloved and goes where the demanded can never go. I wonder if as we end this afternoon, we can take off Saul's armor about the future. I wonder if we can lighten the load a little bit and go, actually, all I need to be to enter, if this is God's plan, what I've been sharing with you, the only thing you need to go there is intimacy with God 
and everything else will follow behind. You'll love the Bible because you're intimate with him. You'll love being with his people because you're intimate with him. So you, you'll, you'll want to be holy because you're intimate with him. You have intimacy, you'll have it all. And this is it. The beloved of the Lord go places the demanded never go. Now here's a thought. There was one tribe that were outstanding with the sling. The Benjamites. But David wasn't a Benjamite. Do you know who was? Saul. So I wonder what he thought as he's there in his heavy armor weighing him down, but he's still scared of fighting this giant. When along comes someone that looks like he used to. Light, unforced rhythms, just a sling and the name of the Lord. It's all I need. I travel in mission the Jesus way, travel light. And I wonder as he saw David swinging that sling, and he was from Judah, not from the Benjamites, but he probably thought, he, he, he's doing that like a Benjamite. I was a Benjamite. I wonder if, as the stone left and hit the giant, I wonder if he thought, I could have done that as a young man. But now I'm weighed down by all that's been demanded of me to fulfill this role, all the ought to's and the should do's. But in the world of the heavy ought to's and should do's, I'm weighed down and powerless. Look at him, this youngster who's winning the hearts of people around about me. Drove Saul nuts, didn't it? This youngster David's got it. The beloved will go where the demanded can never go. How's about as we end our leaders' time together this afternoon, we go, God, it's probably easier said than done, but help me to take off Saul's armor, get back to being light-footed, joyful of heart, easy of spirit, and enjoy what you've called us to do. I don't wanna live seeing what God once did, or even too much into the future. I just want to see what the Father's doing and do that. I want to live in the moment. I don't have tomorrow's grace yet, but I've got today's grace right now. I'm going to live it to the full. I'm going to live it to the full. How's about we lift off all the weary burden of decades and decades of how church should look and work. And instead we come back to the fields with a bit of a song become a friend of God once again. Say, God, what would you like to do? God's up in heaven. Hey, I like that sling. Would you like an adventure park? A farm? A restaurant? A mission team? I meet so many people called to transform business but they feel cookie cutted into, but this is what a minister looks like. One of my friends, very influential. He was so, I mean, he's gone about as high up in business as you can go. Now he's impacting thousands of lives around the world. And yet he spent a good two decades wrestling with, but I should be in ministry, but I should be in ministry. But I should. And it took a prophet coming along to say, you are in ministry but you're transforming the medical industry and education and stuff like that, bringing the kingdom of God in. How's about we lift the armor off, get our sling back and be the beloved of the Lord. The only thing you need to make it in the new era is to be the beloved of the Lord. You will have all the imagination, all the faith, all the holiness, all the scriptural knowledge you need if you fall in love with him more than anything and will take the gates of hell and will rip them off their hinges and will plunder media and we will plunder the medical sphere and we'll plunder politics for the kingdom of God if we are the beloved.